Hello, and welcome to episode 5 of Project Slave 1. It's taken a long time, but I've now finally finished the cockpit module. As you'll have seen in the last episode, I decided to make it actually rotate, to give a practical solution to Slave 1's strange flight and landing configurations. While my design isn't canon, it is credible, and was a challenge which I'm glad I took on. It was a lot of fun too. I also managed to get the canopy vacuum formed, which was a massive relief. You can now start to see more of the character of Slave 1. There are still a few areas I want to tweak, but we'll get to those in due course. As you can see, there's still a long way to go before it looks like the original model, but I'm well on the way. In this episode, I'll get the rear section of Slave 1 detailed, and then get all the main sections finally glued together. There are quite a few reference photos out there from when Slave 1 has been exhibited. These exhibition shots have some small parts missing from the tail, and also show that the panel under the tail has come loose. I just have to make sure that I check my references very carefully. While I'm prepared to make some compromises, I'll certainly do my best to get the detail right. The 3D files for the tail section are in four main parts, three for the spine and one for the underside. While there is detail on here, the panel lines are in the wrong orientation, and the lumpy bits bear little relation to the real thing. The only details I considered saving were some of the pipework and the entry door, which was accurate, but with the surgery this patient was going to need, I decided not to take prisoners. The 3D prints were in ABS from my Ultimaker printer, and the first thing I decided to do was file off all the detail. Where I filed through the shell, I patched it back up from the inside with Milliput. The main sections fitted together really well, using the Gambody tab system. Gambody have an excellent range of models for 3D printing. There's certainly a few subjects on their site I'm going to tackle in the future. Just check out the link in the description to see Slave 1 and many more great models. With the main sections superglued together, I filled the underside with a plate of 2mm styrene, and then filled and sanded the surface back down flat. At this stage, the detail had been consigned to a fire sale. Everything had to go. The filler I chose to use was Isopon P38 Car Body Filler. After trying a few other fillers on other projects, I thought I'd give this a go. If it's stable enough for cars bouncing around, it should be good enough for Slave 1. I had used it before, so I had a pretty good idea what to expect. To fill in smaller areas, I'm going to use this air drying acrylic stopper putty. It's made by the same people that make Isopon. You just apply it straight from the tube and wait for it to dry, which takes about half an hour before you can sand it down. I now needed to add detail to the underside of the tail, and using the photos as reference, I drew up a plan to actual size as a guide. Then it would just be a matter of cutting out the parts and gluing them in place. My material of choice for the detail was the same as what the model makers on Slave 1 had used back in the day, styrene. I had a pretty good selection of strip and sheet styrene, and bought some stair mouldings which I thought looked like some of the mouldings on the hull. I'll probably end up getting some more strip in different profiles, but this will at least get me started. I can use regular styrene solvent in a bottle to glue the styrene together, but where it goes onto the filler, I'll have to use super glue. I also made up a small plan as a guide for the very end of the tail too, just to help me work out what was going on. After a day of cutting and gluing, this is where I'm at. I've used 0.5mm styrene sheet here, mainly just carefully measuring from my plan, marking up the styrene in pencil, and cutting it out with a sharp scalpel. I actually found it quite therapeutic, and really enjoyed the process. I'm certainly very pleased with the result. As long as you measure carefully, and make sure your cuts are square, it all goes very well. I'll add the finer detail later, but for the moment, I'll just concentrate on the flat panels that I can make from the styrene. This will be my base layer. While I worked out what to do next with the tail, I decided to crack open the isopon and fill the lower rear hull. This stuff is super sticky and goes off really quickly. Within quarter of an hour it was good to be sanded back. I love these quick drying fillers. It means I can get so much more done in just a few hours. I couldn't get the finish I wanted just with the isopon, so I gave it a coat of the stopping putty, which went on really easily with a spreader made from an off cut of styrene. While I waited for that to dry, I went back to the tail section. 
I decided to clad it in sheet styrene. This may seem a bit crazy, but I figured it would give me a flat, straight surface that would just be of one material. This would make scribing panel lines a lot easier and give me a better, more consistent result than scribing through glue, ABS and various fillers. After a few paper templates, I cut this out of the sheet styrene. It's pretty flexible, but I knew it would still be a challenge to bond it to the main tail section. After the application of a lot of superglue, this is what I ended up with. It was a bit of a nightmare, but it came out well in the end. There are a few spots without any glue behind them, but they'll never show. The surface finish is excellent, it's straight and flat, and now I've just got to trim back the edges. I could have used a knife or tin snips to do this, but they could distort the edge, so instead I just put a drill bit in my Dremel and went for it. A 2mm bit should be strong enough not to break under load, but small enough not to rip the styrene. One thing to be careful about is going too quickly and the styrene melting and forming a ball on the end of the drill bit. This can happen very quickly and cause a lot of damage. This is a really quick technique and gets the bulk of the material easily removed. I'll trim it back to the 3D print with a sharp scalpel and finish off with files. Meanwhile, the filler on the lower hull has dried and been sanded back to a smooth finish I'm happy with. A rub down with some fine wire wool has even polished the surface. Now on to the next stage, marking out the panel lines. The 3D printed lines are way too heavy and many are in the wrong place. Those marking out the boarding ramp are supposed to be parallel, but as you can see, they're not. Once again, reference photos of the original model are invaluable here. The most important tool for this job is a flexible straight edge to conform to the curves of the hull. I'm fortunate to have this old thin steel rule, but you could use anything. The hard part is holding it firmly in place while you mark out the lines. The lines are initially marked out in pencil before being checked and redrawn with a permanent marker. The lower horizontal lines were put in by freehand at this stage. The same process was carried out for the tail section, but the lines were just drawn in pencil. I wasn't happy with the end of the tail, so I thinned down the sides of the 3D print and removed the detail I'd added earlier. I also marked out in pencil where the pipework would go for the next stage of the tail section. On the 3D prints, the panel lines were perpendicular to the ground, when they should have been perpendicular to the top of the spine. Once I was happy with their location, I scribed them in with a basic engineer's scribe. I just use a sharp and steel point run through a couple of times, then the back side of a short rigid scalpel blade. The styrene is really easy to scribe, as unlike the 3D prints beneath, it has no grain, so the scribe stays straight and true. For the pipework, I bought some 2.5mm aluminium craft wire. It comes on the reel and is really easy to bend. The problem was, I needed it straight. To straighten it out, I cut off the length I need and roughly take out as many bends as I can by hand. I then put it on a hard, flat surface and using a flat steel block, roll it back and forth, pushing down hard all the time. After just a few seconds, hey presto, a straight aluminium rod. Now, let's plumb up the tail section. I've been dreading this stage as I was worried that I wouldn't be able to get the paired rods to sit neatly together through the bends I had to make. It actually went a lot easier than I'd hoped. The aluminium was easy to bend and stayed in whatever position I wanted, without it springing back. They look really good on the tail section. I'm so glad I went for this method. I now had all the major sections ready for assembly. The cockpit unit was complete. I'd also filled and sanded the front of the lower hull, top and bottom. The rear lower hull now had the panel line scribed in, and I'd filled and sanded the underside too. The pipework for the tail was super glued in place, and I was good to go. And here it is, super glued and epoxied together. The joins have been filled with isopon and sanded back. Any joins underneath have been flooded with super glue. It definitely won't be coming apart again. It's also getting a lot heavier now it's fully assembled, and there's still a lot more to add in future episodes. I now need to continue the styrene cladding forward to make it flush with the rest of the cockpit area. Again, this was fixed in place with superglue, and a new join line was cut to match the angle of the studio model. 
I've also reinstated the styrene detail at the end of the tail, which looks a lot better with the thinned down side walls. I added the styrene sheet to the rest of the upper hull, in sections, again using superglue. It was then filled and sanded smooth, ready for more panel lines to be added later. I created a lip over the back of the canopy, which now holds itself in place without any glue. It takes a bit of flexing to get in and out, but I now have my technique down. This canopy is a spare and will stay on to keep the dust out. When Slave 1 is finished, I'll switch it to a fresh one. So, I'm now getting closer to the real Slave 1, but there's still a lot to do. The cockpit and front end of the original was very different to the Gambody 3D model. Referring back and forth to the original photos, I felt the nose of the upper hull was too steep, so I added some isopon to re-sculpt it to a better curve. It definitely gives Slave 1 a more streamlined, meaner look, which I really like. I may have gone a little too far in hindsight, but it's an easy fix. Let me know what you think in the comments. The main problem areas of the hull are now well under control. I can now move on to the next stage of this build. That'll be adding all the small details to the hull, as well as the guns for the tail section. Back in the day, these would have been taken from a vast array of plastic kits. These are no longer available, but with the advent of the 3D printer and my new styrene skills, I'm confident I can reproduce them pretty well. Then it'll be on to the underside, where I'll tackle the next nightmare that is Slave 1's engines. I hope you're enjoying Project Slave 1. If you are, please share with your friends and make sure you subscribe to my channel. So you catch my next video when it goes live, click on the bell icon. As you can see from my channel, I always have lots of projects going on, which I hope you'll find interesting. These range from my staples and vine models, featured in Sarah's vlog, to short projects and my popular how-to series. If you have any questions about Project Slave 1, just leave them in the comments and I'll get back to you. Thanks for watching.